I know we just had a ton of announcements, but I do want to I do want you to update your calendar on a couple of additional things. Number one, we are having a Christmas Eve Eve service right here at your place church. And so we're super excited about that. There's going to be two service times uh, that that night. Uh, the first service is actually going to be a kid-friendly service, and so the kids' ministry is going to be doing a lot. Um, and then we're going to roll right from that into a pretty exciting January. I know for us, uh, 21 days of prayer is a big deal. I want you to put that on your calendar because I want you to already start thinking about that. We're going to join Highlands again at 6 a.m. We did this in August. Uh, we're going to join them at 6 a.m. up in the small auditorium. We are expecting some amazing things to happen. Again, they talked about how um, the, uh, the life groups are starting in January, but we're also going to do an all-dream team meeting January the 9th that, that, uh, that month. Um, and then, of course, um, spring life groups. And then we're going to close it out with our annual impact award. So, again, lots going on at your place, church. You should not be bored about anything that we're doing around here. There's plenty to do, and we're super excited about all of it. Today, I would like to invite you to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We have been in this zeal for the house series, and I'm just going to keep on rolling with it if it's okay with you guys. I, I, I have messaging probably for the next two weeks as we approach Christmas. Um, we're going to, Jesus is all the way through it. Amen, everyone. Jesus is all the way through the scripture, but we've been talking about this zeal. And of course, that word zeal comes from the Greek word zealous. Now, zealous literally means a burning emotion. This inner feeling of boiling over from heat, it means something very fervent or red hot, as with uh, spirit-fueled zeal to serve the Lord. And the question that we've been asking ourselves as we look around the landscape of our community, of our church, even of our world, is have we allowed this season that we find ourselves in to distract or even dilute us from our zeal for the, for the things of God? I know for me personally, I mean, just last Thursday, I was, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine. We spent about an hour together. And... Um, hung out it was great well he texted me last night and said bro just so you know i tested positive for covid and i'm like bro that stinks and i know technically i should probably be quarantining right now um except for the fact that we spent an hour on the phone together he lives in texas i live in oklahoma right but i was technically in contact with him all right and you know there are those of us, you know what I mean? If we're going to be completely honest, we would have called our employer and said the phrase, I was in contact with someone who tested positive for COVID, right? And we wouldn't be lying. We wouldn't be lying because we were in contact, but yet would we? And so here's what's going on. I don't want the season to detract us or water down or dilute our zeal or even our moral character our integrity just for a, you know, couple of weeks off that I won't get fired for, right? And so that's the thought. Are we allowing our zeal in the season that we find ourselves in to be distracted or even diluted? And so I want to talk through some things, and I want to show you another account of zeal for the house of the Lord or for what is important to the Lord here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. But before we do, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's get your heart right. This is not just, you know, what you do on Sunday mornings. This is, you're not punching a clock here. You don't get heaven points for this. You, you, you want to come and you want to receive from the Lord today. Amen, everyone. You want the word of God to come alive as you read it. You want it to move you. And so how we approach the scriptures and how we approach this time will determine that. So let's pray. Father, we love you. And we thank you for the opportunity once again to look into your holy written word. Father, we know that the entrance of your word brings light. And that's what we want, Father. We want light. We want understanding. Father, we want to hear what you're speaking directly to us. Father, we... 
We don't want our moral or integrity to be diluted. We don't want our spiritual zeal to be diluted. So, Father, we press into this today, and we allow you to speak to us as we look through your word, and we worship you for it in advance in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're taking notes, again, I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. The Bible says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to know about the grace the, that God has given the Macedonian churches. Now, he's talking about a collection of churches over in the region of Macedonia. So not just one church, not just one person. This is actually a group of churches in the Macedonian area. Verse 2 says, in the midst of a very severe trial. In the midst of a very severe, it's, 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 it's a tough season. There's a tough economic condition going on. These Macedonian churches are, are experiencing this. But, but keep reading. So it says, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. So it's important to point out that these were not wealthy people. It's, it's a very tough time. There's severe, as the scripture says, a severe trial. They're in extreme poverty. Yet, for whatever reason, they, they had this display, the Bible says, of rich generosity. Verse 3 says, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, the scripture says entirely on their own. In other words, no one was begging them to do this. If anything, someone should have probably been receiving an offering for them. But yet they wanted to be a part of this thing. They wanted to be a part of what God was doing. Verse 4 says, they urgently pleaded with us, look at this word, for the privilege, the scripture says, for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. This is talking about an offering right here. The whole context of this story is centered around a, a moment where people were giving. And most people, if we're going to be honest, they don't see offering time as a privilege. But yet the Macedonian churches did. Verse 5 says, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a, uh, a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. So remember, he's talking to the Corinthians here about these Macedonian churches, right? Verse 7 says, but since you... Corinthians, Christians, believers, since you, the Bible says, excel in everything. You guys, you excel in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled, uh, and the love we have kindled in your love for us. See that you also, the scripture says, Paul's talking to these guys, hey, you're awesome, Paul's saying, but you know what? See to it also that you excel in this grace of giving, he says. In other words, you got the faith thing figured out. You're pretty smart. You got a pretty good prayer life going on like God's moving in your churches. But don't just pause right there. See to it that you excel in the grace of giving. Verse 8 says, I'm not commanding you. In other words, hey, I'm not telling you to do anything, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. And so we kind of see him going, hey, you guys are rocking it here, but look at these Macedonian churches in their extreme poverty and severe trial. They're begging us to get involved with this generosity piece. They're begging to get involved with what our ministry is involved in. They're begging us to be a part of it. Why? 
because there is this grace of giving. Verse 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich, the scripture says. Now, are we Bible believers? Do we, do we believe that the word of God is true? And there's, for some of us, I'm going to speak along the lines that are going to challenge some things that you have been taught in your upbringing. Maybe some things you, you misunderstood about the character and the nature of of God. This group of scriptures here is a complete reversal of what most preachers have to do. The Macedonian churches begged to get into the offering. Most preachers have to stay. Now, you guys are pretty good at this. I don't have to get up here and be like, if you guys don't give, we're going under. You guys are pretty good. You're, you're generous. But the Lord led me to this text and wanted me to share it today. So I believe that something is supposed to happen in our hearts over the next few minutes. The amplified version of verse 9 says, For you are recognizing more clearly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his astonishing kindness, his generosity, his gracious favor, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And the Amplified further defines that as abundantly blessed. One translation says that you can be abundantly supplied for. Are you with me, friends? Is this the holy written word of God? Yes. Is this God's character and nature for you? Yes, it absolutely is. So the reason why a lot of people struggle in this area is, I believe there are a lot of people who are ashamed of this part of the gospel because they've been taught that this is not what God feels. And yet I'm going to inundate you with scriptures today. So many people are ashamed of this part of the gospel. And because of that, they reject this message. And so they don't teach their people this. Pastors won't teach their people these lines of scripture. And so therefore, they don't have faith for it. So they're not as blessed as God would have them to be. Can I ask you a question? Who benefits the most of Christians being broke? More than anyone else, the devil. The devil is not interested in you prospering. He is not interested in you excelling in, er in, any, ever, in any area. Excuse me. Most people I know who are Christian and wealthy have no problem with the topic of generosity because God has blessed them. And so for them, generosity is just a way of life generosity and if you talk to most of them they will equate generosity with how they got wealthy they'll connect the dots right there for you well, there was a season when uh, we were pretty strapped and things weren't looking good and we just begin to trust God with our finances and next thing you know this deal happened or this business opportunity came or I sold this piece of property or this investment and next thing you know here we are most people who are believers who are wealthy, have no problem with the generosity message. Why? Because we are in, by nature, those people who love. And so it, it <laughs> one of the biggest things the devil will try to do is he'll try to keep Christians from being generous. And if he can keep us strapped, he can keep us from being generous. Does this make sense, friends? Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel literally means good news. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Verse 17 says, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed.
world a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. In other words, everything about the gospel, everything about your Christian walk has to do with faith, with what you understand about the character and nature of God, with what you believe about him from first to last. The gospel is good news. Amen, everyone? And I think people need some good news right now. I think, I think it would do us all really good to get some good news. I mean, the numbers seem to be in an uptick right now with some of the COVID cases. The economists are kind of preaching a little bit of doom and gloom. We could use some really good news right now. Jesus said that the whole reason he's come to earth is to preach the good news. That's what he said in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The Bible says, this is Jesus speaking, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, Jesus said. Hey, listen, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. And I think it's pretty evident as we saw him walk through the towns and villages in the Scripture that the Spirit of the Lord is on him. Well, what was the Spirit of the Lord on him to do? Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news. He goes on to say, good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovering of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. Jesus is like, hey, listen, I've been anointed to do this. I've been anointed to proclaim the good news to the poor. To, he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovering of sight to the blind and to set the oppressed free. Well, what do you think good news to the poor person would be? That they don't have to be poor no more. Amen, everyone? And yet we have a problem with that. But as we, as we go through this, the good news to the lost is that they would be saved, right? We don't have a problem with that part of the scripture. The, the good news to a, a sick person is that they could be healed. Yeah, we don't have a problem with that. The good news to the poor is that they would be rich. All of a sudden, we're like, well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know about that. Why? We believe the rest of the verse. Why wouldn't we believe this part as well? Can I have an amen, somebody? Amen. And this is gospel. This is good news. Have you ever met a blessed person? And they'll tell you, man, I'm blessed. And they know they're blessed. A blessed person knows they're blessed. You walk up to somebody, you say, hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm blessed. And, and, and there's two types of people in the world. There's the one person that's I'm blessed is just a salutation. How are you today? Oh, I'm blessed. Amen. Good. Good. Awesome. And then there's another person who says, hey, how are you? Oh, I'm blessed. And you can tell the difference of the person who this is just a salutation and a person who believes that. There is something to the blessing of the Lord. Do you know what it means to be blessed? Romans chapter 15 verse 29 says, I know that when I come to you, I come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. Not just a little bit, the full measure of the blessing of Christ. Galatians chapter 3 says, uh, you in all the nations will be or shall be blessed, so then, so then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. What's he talking about? Being blessed. You have permission to see yourself as blessed by God. Jesus said the whole reason I came was so that you can Know the good news that I've blessed you. You don't have to feel guilty about being blessed. Amen, everyone? It's okay to understand what that means. Well, what does that mean? The vast majority of people do not believe that it is God's will for them to be blessed. And worse, they poke fun at people who refer to themselves as being blessed. They think it's arrogant or being proud. Acts chapter 13, verse 45. 
when the Jews saw the crowds. So here's, you know, here's the apostles. They're out ministering life to people. The Jews see all of this action going on. They saw the crowds. They were filled, the Bible says, with jealousy. Look at the crowds they're getting. Look at all the people listening to them. Look at all the people that's following them. The Bible says the Jews were filled with jealousy. And they begin to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. You know, I've noticed something. People who aren't doing anything in life are often critical of the ones who are. I'll say that again. People who aren't doing anything in life, they're not making a difference, are often critical of the ones who are doing something, the ones who are making a difference. And that's what's going on right here. Verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak to the, the word of God to, uh, we had to speak the word of God to you first, since you rejected it, and did and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. So these Jews didn't consider themselves worthy to inherit eternal life. They didn't consider themselves worthy to be blessed by God. And listen, I'm not talking about us deserving anything. We don't deserve it. This is the price that Jesus Christ paid for you. Jesus Christ made you worthy. Is this okay, friends? Are you, are you understand? Are you picking up what I'm laying down here? Because this is pretty important stuff. The, the New King James Version says it this way in verse 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. And contradicted and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you rejected it. There's a lot of people rejecting the word of God. Rejecting its truth. And then look at this. And judged yourselves unworthy. So now we've gone from, well, I'm not worthy. No, you actually think you're unworthy to be blessed by God. I'm just going to pause right here for a second, let that sink in. Do you feel unworthy to be blessed by God? Because it has precious little to do with your worthiness. It has everything to do with with the full measure of God's blessing and anointing. And I'll say this just kind of as a, on a side note. You'll never have what you criticize in someone else. Well, they're just, well, you know how they got that. They got that by, well, you know, Criticizing, you'll never have what you criticize someone else having. Amen, everyone? If there's one thing the devil hates more than a believer, it's a wealthy believer. It's a wealthy believer. Now, real quickly, in closing, I've got a few, I've got about nine minutes here. Nine minutes. I want to give you three things that the blessing of God does for you. Three things that I'm going to show you by Scripture what the blessing of the Lord gives you. Number one, the blessing of God gives you the power to acquire. The power to acquire. Well, I'm going to need to see some chapters and verse on that. Glad you asked. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He, capital H, it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. The scripture says, the blessing of God gives you the power 
to acquire, and according to this scripture, to acquire wealth. The TEV version says the ability to get rich. Most people don't not, they do not think that God is interested in you getting wealthy. But according to this, it is. I know for Tyra and I, we just believe God for favor. Everywhere I go and everything I do, I just believe, God, that his favor shines on me. Before I go into any kind of a negotiation, I pray, Lord, Lord, I thank you for the favor. I thank you that your favor follows me. It surrounds me. No one gets into the ministry to get rich. Right? Um, And so I have had to believe God for us to excel. A lot of people look at Tyra and I's life and they're like, man, that church must pay them well. They do. But that's not how we got what we got. We got what we got as a result of the blessing of the Lord. Are you with me, friends? I, I believe God for favor. I, I, like to, I like to buy and sell. There was one time I, I was going to buy this Durango. Plum color. Ugly. If you have a plum car, I'm sorry. Okay? Sorry. But this was ugly, ugly Durango, um, and I was talking to the guy about it, and I was, uh, his, he, let us, he let his son drive us to high school one day, and so I'm in the high school parking lot backed into it, so it's like I got this wrecked door now. And so I, I was like, well, how much, how much are you asking for it? And he was already asking pretty low, but I had cash, and I'm like, well, this is how much cash I've got. Um, would you take it? Yes. You could tell. He just kind of wanted to get rid of it, right? So I bought it. I, I took it. I paid, I paid a guy. Uh, who I know that does auto body work, about 500 bucks, he fixed the door. I, I bought it for 4,000. No, I bought it for 3,500, put 500 into it, sold it for $7,000. I believe it's the favor of the Lord on me. Does this make sense? We, uh, we bought a boat a few years ago, and, and we just had, you know, we had this amount of money that we wanted to spend on it. I think we spent like $5,000 on a boat. It's a nice boat, go fast boat, ski boat, wakeboard. We had fun with this boat. Kept it, I don't know, five or seven years. I don't remember how long we had that boat. Five or seven years. Sold it last summer, right? Just decided we want to upgrade. Sold it last summer and uh, sold it for $9,000. And the guy thanked me for selling it to him so cheap because he'd been looking around for boats. He just could not find one. Well, we started applying some of this stuff to houses, bigger investments. The key is, is we're led every single time. We don't just buy for the sake of buying. We're like, Lord, we're believing God for favor here. Is this your favor? The very first house we bought, we paid $50,000, sold it for $80,000. Do you see it? Now, just because the blessing of the Lord is there, you still have to put your hand to something. But the key is to be led by the Spirit of God in all your dealings. Well, I just don't want to do that. Okay. But it has served us very well trust God in this area of our life. What does the blessing of God do? It gives you the ability to gain wealth. The second thing that the blessing of God does is it gives you the power to enjoy it. Are you with me, friends? You don't have to feel guilty about enjoying the blessing of God in your life. Ecclesiastes talks about this in in chapter 5, verse 19. Moreover, When God gives someone wealth and possessions, stop. Who gives it? Is this scripture? When God gives someone the, uh, gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, God gives you the ability to enjoy what he's blessed you with. The scripture says, to accept their lot and be happy with their toil, this is a gift of God. And I've realized you can't enjoy anything on this planet unless God's involved in it. I know a lot of people who are wealthy in possessions, but they don't have God and they're miserable. And then I know a lot of people who have very little, but yet God's right in the middle of it and they're enjoying life. Amen, everyone? You have permission to enjoy the blessings of God in your life. Three things that that the blessing does. It gives you power to acquire. It gives you power to enjoy. And then the last one is it gives you power to give. And this is the greatest one of them all. 
Acts chapter 20, verse 35 says, In everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, saying it is more blessed to give than receive. Until you become a giver, you don't understand this text. So many people, they just see themselves on the receiving side all the time, never on the giving side. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 21 says, Blessed is the one who is kind to the needy. Verse 31 says, uh, Whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Proverbs 17, 5 says, Whoever mocks the poor shows contempt for their maker. Whoever gloats over disaster will not go unpunished. Proverbs 19, 17 says, He will reward them for what they've done. Proverbs 28, 27 says, uh, those who give to the poor will lack nothing. In the CEV version, it says, giving to the poor will keep you from poverty. And if you close your eyes to their needs, everyone will curse you. But if you've never seen or been blessed, then you are ashamed of what the Word of God says about this. Okay, does this make sense, friends? Like some of you guys are just like, I just don't know about this. Go back and re-look at those scriptures for yourself. Do your own study. Do your own study. We've heard scriptures that says, you know, money's the root of all evil. No, the love of money is the root of all evil. And it is. But money is not evil. God wants you wealthy so you, he will bless you so you can be a blessing and these Macedonian churches knew that and they were like we got to get involved we got to get involved and it is December so once again we as a church are going to make a we're going to do a one big give weekend December the 20th and we're going to give every single penny of it away because this is a generous church amen everyone we're going to sow we're going to sow into efforts like Conduit Missions, who is on the ground right now rescuing families. I got a text from Darren Tyler yesterday talking about how they're rescuing families from slave labor. A lot of these guys have, uh, have uh, they've had medical bills come up and say they go to tradesmen and they borrow money. And if they, if they can't pay it back, the, 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 trade, the laborer comes and takes them and their kids and forces them into slave labor until they can pay their debt off. The problem is, is the interest rates are so high that they can never get ahead because they don't pay them enough to pay off the debt. And so they're trapped. We're going we're gonna to invest into things like uh, Mays County DHS and foster care. The, 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 the foster care community of Mays County, we've always had a heart for that. We're going to give to One Hope, which is trying to get, and they're doing it, the Word of God into the hands of every child on the face of the planet. And uh, I'm, I'm super excited because on that weekend, I'm going to show you a video that, um, that they, they sent us because of the generosity of the people of Your Place Church. We're making a difference. Amen, everyone. We're making a difference. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to begin praying about it now. Begin praying and asking the Lord, what do you want me to do? And then believe God for it. Believe God. If it's something more than you've ever done in the past, great. We've got several weekends here before the, the 20th comes around that we can watch what God does. And then when that weekend comes and he's blessed you, sow it, be a part of it, because you're blessed. Amen. Father, we love you. And we thank you for what the word of God says. And Lord, we are not going to be the, those, we're not going to be the church, we're not going to be the people who just turns a blind eye to what your heart is. Your heart is to bless your people. Father, you said that you've given us power to get or acquire wealth. You've given us power to enjoy it. And then, Father, you've given us power to give. And, Lord, we want to be considered those who give, who you can trust, Father, to 
to be generous to those that are in need. And Father, I thank you for using us over the next few weeks, Father God. Lord, begin to deal with our own hearts about what we're supposed to do during this one big give offering that we can sow and meet the needs of so many people on our planet, Father. We're excited about this. We're excited about this, God. Use us this month to make a difference in this, in this world that we live in. We give you praise and we give you glory for it right now. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. Some of you guys, you came prepared to give today. You know that uh, the Lord's blessed you. Um, there's several ways you can get involved in this. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 8, it says, Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them. Who's that talking about? It's talking about your heavenly Father. So here, people give in the offering, right? But they're not given to the church. They're not given to a pastor. They're not given to pay the light bill. They're giving to the Lord. And the Bible says he receives that. He sees their heart. He sees our heart. And then he blesses us as a result of that. Amen, everyone. Stand up with us. We're going to pray and believe God and dedicate this uh, to the Lord. You came prepared to give. Um, we're believing God for just supernatural increase in your life. Father, we love you. We thank you right now for the opportunity to sow, the opportunity to give. Father, we're reminded of the Macedonian churches. Father, how they were eager to be a part. God, they, they begged to be a part of, the, of this opportunity. So, Father, we see it that way. Lord, for some of us in the room, this is, the, this is our favorite part of the service because we get to be used by you. We get to worship you with our giving. So, Father, we bring it to you. We ask you to bless it, Father God. I think you, that just like a seed in the ground produces a harvest, Father, you bless this. And, Father, you bring a harvest to all those who are sowing. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you guys. Enjoy the rest of your week. If you made a decision to follow Christ today, I believe heaven is celebrating with you. By far, you have changed the direction of your life forever. If you made that decision or are new with us, we have some simple next steps for you. In the description of this video is a link for our connection card. If you could fill that out, we would love to hear about you and your decision today. Don't worry, we aren't going to spam your email or blow up your phone. We simply want to help you with the next steps of your spiritual journey. Lastly, if you'd like to get notified when we go live, simply click the bell icon and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We love you and can't wait to see you again next week.